Dr. Ken Lando. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about a new therapy available for the hallucinations and delusions of Parkinson's disease. The drug, known as Nuplazid, or Pimavanserin, was developed by Acadia Pharmaceuticals out of San Diego. There are ads that you've probably seen on the television telling you a little bit about the hallucinations and delusions and the potential for problems and suggesting if you want more information go to moretoparkinsons.com. If you do that, you'll learn a little bit more about the association. They don't sell you anything, don't even tell you that a pill exists, at least at the present time. They do say that it's sponsored by Acadia Pharmaceuticals. The drug, Nuplazid, was approved in April of 2016. It is the only drug specifically designed for the purpose. There is no other drug that is approved for the purpose. That doesn't mean that there aren't other drugs that have been used to treat the condition. Parkinson's relatively common. About a million people have it in the United States. Typically it occurs in people over age 60. As many as 40 to 60 percent of the people ultimately may develop some of the hallucinations and delusions. Parkinson's itself is associated with motor abnormalities, a little bit of shake, especially at rest, especially involving the hands, some rigidity, slowness of movement, and some postural instability. Well, if a person does indeed develop the symptoms of hallucinations and delusions, maybe just in the natural course of the disease, tend to occur relatively well into the disease, not near the start of the disease. But the symptoms come on either as a consequence of just having the disease or sometimes because of the treatment. The treatment tends to be Cinemet for the Parkinson's, for the motor abnormalities of the disease. And the Cinemet or the L-DOPA can sometimes cause these same kind of symptoms. If you get the symptoms, then the choice up to the present time is either lower the dose of Cinemet or L-DOPA or take an atypical antipsychotic, a drug like clozapine or Seroquel. Now, the problem is that if you don't have warning that the hallucinations and delusions might occur, they can scare the dickens out of you. But fortunately, they're often, the symptoms are often relatively benign, but they come in mild, moderate, and severe varieties. They tend to occur, as I mentioned, well into the disease, and they're not a specific disease themselves. They're just a complication. They're just symptoms. They can be frightening. They can be confusing. They can cause a person to lash out. And sometimes they even are responsible for a person not being able to be controlled by the caretaker or the spouse and then having to be put into a nursing home. Well, the symptoms, hallucinations, are believing you're having experiences that there's no basis for or delusions where you have false beliefs. So the hallucinations, well, they can be visual. So you can see animals or people or objects that really aren't there. Or you can hear things, music or voices or other noises, again, that aren't there. Or you can smell things that aren't there. Or you can feel things brushing up against your skin, but there isn't anything. Or you can have abnormalities of taste when there isn't anything that you're tasting. And then the delusions, you can believe that your spouse is having an affair, you can believe people are stealing from you, you can believe that you're being persecuted or you're being bugged. The hallucinations tend to occur more frequently, the delusions tend to occur with more comorbid problems, more other diseases associated with more advanced disorder. If we go by the definition According to the National Institutes of Mental Health, the hallucinations and delusions, when they come on for the Parkinson's disease psychosis, it's that false sense that we were talking about. Symptoms can either be recurrent or they can be continual, have to be for at least a month, and it can't be because you're suffering from some other kind of psychological or psychiatric or drug-related event. Now, the drugs that have been used up to the present time are Seroquel and Clozapine, but those drugs, as I mentioned, have the potential for some significant adverse effects, and all antipsychotics, including the Nuplazid, have to carry a black box warning saying that 
if a patient has dementia, and dementia related to the psychosis, that, that this drug, these drugs, might increase the risk of death. Well, in 2014, the Food and Drug Administration gave Nuplazid a uh, designation as breakthrough status, breakthrough drug. They also said that it could be granted priority evaluation. In other words, went to the head of the line as far as evaluation was concerned. But the breakthrough therapy confuses people because the breakthrough therapy in common English sounds like it ought to be a wonderful advance. That's not what it means. Breakthrough therapy, according to the Food and Drug Administration, is just a drug that may or may not work. They're not making any kind of supposition. There's some initial evidence that it might be okay on some animal work or some laboratory work, but it fills a need, or potentially can fill a need, for which there's no other designated therapy. That's all it means. So it doesn't mean that the drug is really a wonderful advance. Well, the FDA looked at the drug and said, you know, this thing really seems to work on serotonin and it doesn't get involved in the dopamine. Remember, the dopamine is so essential to the Parkinson's disease. And, and the dopamine can be interrupted by those other antipsychotics also. So here we have a potential advance. This is a new family of drugs. It's known as a selective serotonin inverse agonist, but it's really just a second generation antipsychotic. Now, they did a study, and the study involved 199 people, not many. And it involved these people for six weeks, very short time period. And during the six weeks, the people on therapy had a 37% reduction in the symptom versus the people on placebo. They had a 14% reduction in the symptoms. So reduction in symptoms on what? Well, they did uh, an evaluation and they monitored them with something known as the SAPS adapted for PD. SAPS, appropriate name, stands for the scale for the assessment of positive symptoms, in this case adapted for Parkinson's disease. There are nine items on the scale. You could have a rating anywhere from zero to five. So the total score could be anywhere between zero and 45. Remember that, remember that. So now they evaluate the people. In the group receiving the new plazid, there originally were going to be 105 people, but at the end there were only 89 left. In the group receiving the placebo, there were about 94 at the start and 87 at the end. At the end of the study, at the end of this grand six-week time period, Remember the SAPs adapted for PD? We said the scale went from 0 to 45. Well, the people who were involved in the study had a relatively low rating. They were rating the scale originally at entry between about 15 and 16 points. So they were in the lower end, and they changed by only about three points during the course of the study. Now, serious adverse events, 4% in the placebo group and 11% in the new plazid group. That's a difference of about 275%. And if we look at the number of people who had to stop taking the drug because of a side effect, it was 10 in the new plazid group against only two in the placebo group. And surprisingly, to recruit these 200 people, they did the assessment, they encouraged the patients to come into the study. They recruited the people from 52 medical centers in the United States. These were academic centers and centers where they do a lot of neurologic research, even a couple centers in Canada. For a short study like this, for a common disease, where they didn't even get all of the patients that they anticipated. So it was a smaller study than they figured they were going to have. Now, the scary thing about this study is it was funded by Acadia, the drug company. They designed the study. They were responsible for the governance. They led the statistical analysis. Several of the authors of the paper were employees of the drug company. They contributed to writing the report. And they had a two-week 
run-in period where the patients were under observation before they were randomized to receive either the drug or the placebo. And even with all of that, they only got a 37% improvement in the symptoms with the drug versus a 14% improvement with placebo. And as a matter of fact, another study had looked at the clozapine, found different patients, even actually more advanced patients, had a greater improvement than it was apparent with the uh, new plazid in the current study. So the studies were not done at the same time. But comparing how the clo clozapine did with one study versus how the new plazid did with another study, looks like the clozapine was a better kind of a drug. However, it does have significantly more side effects. So let's look at some other studies that were done using the drug, comparing it against placebo. Well, they did a study that was really a safety study. It lasted for 28 days. They did a different SAPS evaluation. It's called SAPS-HD. And on that scale, they found the drug didn't seem to work. Then they did another study, and it was a six-week study. They did the SAPS-HD evaluation on them. Again, didn't work. Then they did another study, the third study. And what happened is that the drug didn't seem to work on the SAPS H plus D, but they didn't finish the study. And we don't know why they didn't finish the study. Was it because of patient safety problem? Was it because of a lack of efficacy? They didn't publish the results. They didn't publish the full results. So we don't really know. So what do you do when you have a lot invested in the drug and it doesn't show improvement on the tests? Change the score. So that's what they did. They came up with, and, and the drug company partially funded, the new assessment. So we go from a SAPS H plus D to now the SAPS adapted for Parkinson's disease. And with that, they were able to show an improvement. Actually, they improved on both scores in the current study. Now, the drug was originally going to be a liquid, but it had such a bitter taste that it came out as a tablet. You take the drug, it peaks in your blood system in about six hours. The half-life is about 60 hours. A metabolite lasts about 200 hours in the blood. If you happen to have some kidney disease of mild to moderate intensity, you can still take the drug, but not if you have a liver problem. Hasn't been evaluated in pregnancy or nursing mothers or children, but Parkinson's disease tends to be a condition that occurs in older individuals, typically over age 60. Drugs associated with some side effects that can cause edema of the ankles and the feet, can cause some nausea or confusion, can cause constipation or a gait problem, can actually even lead to hallucinations in some people and allergies, can cause angioedema, swelling of the lips and the throat, can cause some shortness of breath interferes with some of the drug metabolizing enzymes in the body and other drugs that interfere with the drug metabolizing enzymes can either increase or decrease the amount of nuplazid in the system and that's a potential problem in those people who have a tendency toward a long, it's known as a QT interval and the QT interval that's uh, uh, discovered or it's found on the electrocardiogram and it has to do with repolarization of the heart now, if this is lengthened too much, and the drug can lengthen it a little bit, and sometimes more than we want, but if the interval gets too long, then it could lead to sudden cardiac death, it could lead to ventricular tachyarrhythmias or ventricular fibrillation, so some nasty stuff, especially if you happen to have a slow heart rate, especially if you happen to have a low potassium or low magnesium, cardiac arrhythmias, if you're taking antipsychotics, if you're taking antibiotics like clarithromycin, or even if you're taking a heart pill, maybe for atrial fibrillation, like amiodarone. Well, you have to remember that nuplazid is being pushed because it only affects the serotonin pathways and doesn't have anything to do with the dopamine pathways. The company is really excited about the drug and wants to begin a study called Harmony. This study is going to be worldwide. It's going to involve 360 people who have dementia and then other associated symptoms. People are going to take the drug, open label, for 12 weeks, and then after 12 weeks, they're going to be randomized to either nuplazid or placebo. See if they maintain the improvement. 
so much, I guess, for the argument that it's not ethical to keep people on placebo for too long a time period. Well, there was another study, and in this study, the company was evaluating the drug for symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease. And after six weeks, they found a teeny weeny little bit of improvement, statistically significant improvement versus placebo. But unfortunately, they kept the study open for another six weeks. And at the end of the 12 week time period, there was no statistical difference between the placebo and the active drug. So they had to report that to the federal government. And there was one final study. And this study had four authors on it, three of whom worked for the company company employees, and it showed a little bit of benefit. Well, there's a lot of money riding on this drug. They estimate that it might bring in sales of as much as one and a half billion, B, billion dollars by 2021. Companies identified 11,000 physicians who they're going to target. They have an uh, estimated sales force of about 132 people who are going to be able to go after those doctors and they think they have a good thing. I'm not sure. I don't know that the data really is all that encouraging, but what I can tell you is the price is phenomenally high. It's $90 a day. $90 a day, about $3,000 a month or about $30,000 plus a year in comparison to Seroquel or Clozapine both of which can be purchased generic for anywhere between ten and thirty dollars. Yes, indeed, they have potential more side effects. Yes, indeed, they can interfere with the uh, motor control of Parkinson's disease. But I can almost tell you that here we have a drug that has the company's fingerprints all over the studies. Every single study has a lot of drug company influence. That's not really good science. That's not science that we can say, boy, I really believe that. And when you read the papers, sometimes there's a lot of, of we could say mumbo jumbo maybe in the papers. And they're going to claim breakthrough status, but we've already discussed breakthrough status doesn't mean what the words to the general public mean. Medically, it just means that there's no other drug that's been approved specifically for the indication. So what's going to be the final result? The final result, unfortunately, is probably going to be a lot of sales of this drug. It's going to be pushed and a lot of people are going to be given prescriptions for it. And it may do something a little teeny weeny bit, but it certainly doesn't seem to be a home run. Remember, we have a three point improvement on a scale of 45. Uh, I'm not going to buy this one. Anyway, that's my opinion. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thank you.